in the intersection of Blessed Virgin Mary. How Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the poor of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Saying this hand to Paul, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's do our 10 seconds. <coughs> and uh, let me know when we're live. We're live? Yes. Oh, we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to, once again, Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Uh, at Holy Apostles, uh, we are pursuing um, the Building Intercultural Competence for Ministers program put together by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. This is what it looks like. For those of you who are members of the Holy Apostles community, you've already received a copy of this book. At least it should have arrived in your mailbox. Um, as long as your address was current. If your address was not current, then we got it back, and we will send it to your current address. Uh, for those of you who are not members of the Holy Apostles community, uh, feel free to pick this up from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. It costs $9.95. And uh, for that low price of under $10, you too can be uh, engaged in the art of intercultural competency. There's my commercial for today. So today we are on module four. And uh, if you will, open your books to uh, page 21. Now the reason this book is so thick, uh, we only have one more module to go, is because the second half of the book is the Spanish version. So it's the same thing in Spanish. At the end of these sessions, the community of Holy Apostles, which is currently uh, operating in a formative capacity in these workshops that we're doing, uh, will produce a book specific to Holy Apostles. And we'll create a template that will enable all the seminaries in the country to uh, use the template to uh, write books that are specific to their own communities. In terms of intercultural competence, in terms of their own globalization or global awareness um, uh, activities. So uh, Holy Apostles is uh, a college that has students uh, in various countries all over the world. The sun never sets on Holy Apostles. So, guideline four, expanding knowledge of the obstacles that impede effective intercultural relations. So um, basically this unit, this chapter is about racism. An obstacle that affects, uh, that impedes effective intercultural relations is uh, the inability of one group to see the humanity of another group. And racism can be systemic and often is. There are uh, persons, perhaps in a dominant group, that have difficulty uh, engaging uh, in a human way persons in a non-dominant group. There can be persons in a non-dominant group that reciprocate. So that's what we'll talk about today. And what I want is, if you will, any experiences that you may have had or any feelings uh, that you may have had that um, uh, of a situation uh, that you can remember in which you felt uh, like you were discriminated against somebody else or you felt you were being discriminated against. And in uh, this country, uh, it's often thought that we are impacted, that we're heavily affected by something called white privilege, which is, in a nutshell, that our country, our systems, our structures are designed to work very well for the dominant group. And the dominant group is Caucasian, is white. So when a member of the non-dominant group tries to move through the system and through the structures, in the same way a member of the dominant group would, that person uh, trips on many of the steps along the way in that system. 
because that person is not uh, inherently a part of that system. Or if that person is, was born in that culture and has grown up in that culture and is inherently a part of that culture, may not uh, be considered by the dominant class for his or her, the fullness of his or her humanity. We call those persons the other. Who is the other? Does, it, does anybody have any experience with seeing somebody as the other or with feeling that you've been seen as the other? We're in a community here at Holy Apostles that is very diverse. We have people from many different countries. Our neighbors. It, our neighbors? Uh, give me an example. Uh, for example, my uh, classmates, sisters, mm -hmm. may be perceived as others. Yes, and the staff, or uh, uh, lay people, everyone. I mean, uh, everything. Right, right. So um, it's possible that when we come into contact with one another, um, we see one another, even in this community, in terms of other. You know, I, I am a, a white um, male, and therefore I'm different from a Vietnamese female. The question is, uh, does that affect our ability to interact in a human way? We're going to talk a little bit about Galatians, what St. Paul wrote. There is no Jew or Greek, right? Yet, the Jews would see the Greeks as non-Jews, and the Greeks would see the Jews as non-Greeks. Did this affect or impact their way, their ability to effectively grow as a church, as an, a single people, who are a people of faith and people of God. Yeah. Can you like recognize the person's other like different, but not, not have any bad consequences because of that? You know what I mean? Like, okay, it's being amazing on Australian and Lebanese. Sure. But, you know, I know that, you know what I mean? Doesn't, That's doesn't, I, ideally. doesn't really have to affect, uh, right, right. you know what I mean? Ideally, we should be able to recognize the other as, a, as a different from us. Yeah, as other than us. But without, and in fact, as St. Catherine said, the reason for such diversity, she was talking in terms of gifts, was so that we would come together, we would know that we had to come together in community in order to thrive, and particularly a community of faith. So yeah, you should be able to recognize a, a Vietnamese sister as not you. <laughs> When I, was, uh, when I I just came here and when I uh, went to uh, pro life in uh, Washington DC, part the way, but uh, we uh, we uh, stopped to uh, get the food. And uh, when I uh, went to buy the food, and the shelter asked me, "Are you Chinese?" I <laughs> because because my English is not too good and. I, I think that is Okay, so the, the person uh, yeah, I think she, she thinks I'm different like the other. Like, or in Vietnam, in Vietnam, if we see the people from Lao, we Lao, <laughs> like almost like low level. We don't, the, the level is like, you feel different. Uh, it's, I think that that's not good, but it's, in reality, it's, Sometimes, because all American maybe see Vietnam uh, like they don't recognize us as Vietnam, Vietnamese. <laughs> maybe are you Chinese? <laughs> I think yes. Right. Okay. Very so you were stereotyped yes. as a particular kind of uh, Asian, yes. perhaps as Asian, yes. and in their mind, all Asians are Chinese. Yes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so they they they. they and, and they may say, okay, if you're Chinese, they may have a prejudice against Chinese. They may say, we know that China is expanding very quickly, uh, industrially, uh, with a gross domestic product 
that is catching up quickly to the United States. And therefore, we perceive that China's a threat. So anybody who looks Chinese is a problem for me right now. It may be what they say. Uh, personally, I, I love the Chinese. I have many friends who are Chinese. This is for my viewing audience. Uh, um, now, in your case, let's go back to the idea of the Laotian. If a Laotian comes to Vietnam, you know this person's a Laotian. Um, do you see this person as a Laotian in a derogatory way or in a bad way? That this person is in Vietnam um, and taking up space that this person should not be taking up, that it should be taken up by Vietnamese. Is there prejudice against Laotians? Laos. From Laos. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah right. Because I think if it like for Vietnamese, like people come from Laos or Cambodia, it's in in our mind we think we are the high level. No, see, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> but is I think that's not good. Not good in in Chinese. Right, no, but you've identified something there. Yes, yes. This is important. Yes. What's important is that as a Vietnamese person, you understand uh, what it means to be a member of the dominant culture. That is, in Vietnam, the Vietnamese are members of the dominant culture. So when a Laotian, someone from Laos, comes into Vietnam, you automatically look upon this person as inferior because the person is Laotian. Now, a question. People in Laos, upon whom do they look as inferior? If somebody were to go into Laos, what would the Laotian say if the person was, say, Vietnamese or Cambodian? Or a Korean. I think, but uh, because when we go out, we work like we, we get a high income, higher income than people living in the. So they would look upon you if you were in Laos yes. as a, a member of the colonial class, as somebody who can come in and instantly uh, receive a higher wage. Yes. Okay, so. Do women in Laos want to marry Vietnamese because of the higher wage? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how transparent you are. This is great. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll let you go for a moment. Daniel, you had something? Coming to Holy Apostles actually has been a very good experience because for the first time in my life, I am a minority. Okay. And the ironic part about it is if I drive 20 minutes home, I'm not. So being in such proximity to where a place where I would be part of the majority, but here, I really have to develop a deeper appreciation of what unites us, and that's the Catholic faith. Right. We are one body in Christ, because there are other New England or Italian-American Catholics here like me saying, you know what, it's okay. It's forcing me to learn. But when you come into an environment uh, that is, has uh, many uh, persons who are not from the dominant uh, United States culture. Uh, do you come in um, uh, with, for instance, and uh, we'll be very blunt, do you come in with a knowledge of, we have a just say yes policy. What's the just say yes policy mean? Just say yes. Just say yes. We have a just say yes policy. You've seen it on the front door when you come in? Say yes. Does anybody know what the say yes policy means? It means that it means no, no, no. We have a just say yes policy. What does that mean? Okay, I'll just give it to you. That means yeah. I'm just gonna just gonna throw it out there. That means that everybody must speak English. You're saying yes to speaking English. Ah, that one. Yeah. Just say yes. See, it was very. It's framed in a very positive way. Say yes. Well, what am I saying yes to? Well, the act of saying yes is an instant act of English. So, in your, how do you say yes in uh, Vietnamese? 
Tuan? Bang. 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 Okay, it's not a just say bang policy. This is a just say yes policy. Okay, but you come in, Daniel, and you speak, have no problem speaking English. So you are automatically coming into this environment with an advantage over anybody who is uh, an international student who is still in a state of developing fluency in English. So when you sit down in a classroom and your faculty are uh, speaking English, you've got no problem. They could throw out words that have not yet been learned by the Vietnamese students, and you've got no problem. Um, so uh, I hear that some faculty record their lectures and post them. And that way, uh, if there's words that Vietnamese students don't uh, know, they can come and review those words later. They can listen to them, stop the tape, look up the words. That takes time, time that you don't have to spend. Um, so when you come in here, uh, you are automatically coming into an environment where you are respecting a greater diversity than you have in the place where you live, but you're bringing with you uh, a uh, cultural advantage. It's um, even more of a cultural disadvantage for the Vietnamese because, well, we have Polish and, and, and French native speakers coming in here, but it's a European language involved, especially with the French, at least it's a lot of cognates. I mean, I know if I can go to Europe, I can go to Spain, Italy, mm -hmm. and France, I can figure out the signs just by looking at them. Right. You know, so it's just more difficult. But the signs, the words, the language, all of that is uh, completely foreign to somebody who comes from a culture that is non-Western. Right. Okay, just to put those thoughts in. When I lived in North Africa, I lived in Tunisia. Tunisians, um, considered Libyans to be uh, the inferior. And so there were lots of Libyan jokes. You may have the same kind of jokes about Laotians. Uh, and I'll give you one. There is a, uh, a Libyan who comes into a uh, appliance store and says, I would like to buy this stove. And the Tunisian who owns the store says, we do not sell to Libyans, get out. And so the Libyan leaves, and she says, well, maybe it's the way I'm dressed. And so he goes and buys some clothes that would be worn in Tunisia. And he shows back up, and he's just like, it looks just like a Tunisian. He says, I would like to buy this stove. And the guy goes, you're the Libyan, get out. And so he leaves again, he thinks, maybe it's my accent. So he finds a Tunisian friend to teach him how to say, I would like to buy this stove in the exact same way that they would say it in Tunisia. He comes back, he's wearing Tunisian clothes, he's got his Tunisian accent. He says, I would like to buy this stove. And the owner says, how many times do I have to throw you out of here? We don't serve Libyans. And he said, well, wait a second, how do you know I'm Libyan? He says, because this isn't a stove, it's a refrigerator. <laughs> okay, so that's a Libyan joke. These kinds of jokes are all over the place. When I first encountered jokes of this nature, I'm from Texas. And of course, as you know, Texans are on the top of the universe. <laughs> if you are a Texan, you automatically consider yourself to be superior to every living creature. Anywhere. However, in Texas, there is a conflict. The persons who go to the University of Texas, who attend the school at the University of Texas, are in perpetual, a perpetual state of tension with the students who go to Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. UT Tyler, I'm the UT Tyler, UT Texas in Austin will tell jokes about people at Texas A&M. They're called Aggie jokes. So what did the Aggie do when he came? An Aggie walks over to Austin and needs a ride. And the people in Austin are worried 
the, uh, the person he stops, the man who's driving the car, says, I have a problem. Uh, everybody's going to know you're an Aggie. And if I get stopped by the police, they're going to be very upset that I am giving a ride to an Aggie. So I want you to do me a favor. There's only one reason why I would be stopped by the police, and that's because my blinkers on my car haven't been working very well. And if I am about to make a turn and the blinker doesn't work, the police will stop me. They'll see I've got an Aggie, and they'll cause a problem for me. So the Aggie says, well, what do we do? And the UT man says, stand behind the car. I'll turn on my blinkers, and we'll see if they're working. If they're working, you tell me yes, and I'll give you the ride. If they're not working, you tell me no, and you get no ride. So the UT man starts his car, turns on his blinkers. The Aggie stands behind the car and listens. And the UT man says, are they working? And the Aggie says, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Oh, geez. Because they're blinkers. <laughs> and when they're off, the Aggie thinks they're not working. <laughs> you can take this joke to the bank. <laughs> not this one in particular, but jokes like it. Because if you're in Vietnam, yeah. you convert this joke to a Laotian joke. And suddenly, everybody in Vietnam says, oh, of course, because the Laotians are a certain way. In Tunisia, these jokes converted very easily to uh, Libyan jokes. And I heard so many Libyan jokes uh, that when I was in Sweden, I converted them to Norwegian jokes. And everybody in Sweden loved me because I could tell jokes that they had never heard before. And they were universally true because everybody in Sweden tells jokes about people in Norway. You can go to Norway and convert them to Sweden jokes and be just as popular. So uh, the jokes that we tell are funny because they have some ring of truth of the stereotype that we're reinforcing through the telling of the joke. Do you have a Laotian joke? Anybody? It, wait, first of all, are there any Laotians in this room? Because I told my Libyan joke once, and half the people laughed, and the other half said, wait a second, we're Libyan. <laughs> At which point I realized I need to know my audience before I told any kind of Libyan joke. I love Libyans. I have many friends who are Libyan, for those in my viewing audience. What I'm trying to uh, convey is that uh, certain uh, every culture has someone, has another cultural group, that it considers inferior, is the issue. So how do we authentically engage these other cultural groups? Even the people at the University of Texas, how can they authentically engage in Aggie and not look down upon the person? Of course, the people who are Aggies, uh, they have similar jokes for the people at UT. So, I mean, it's reciprocal. We're all Texan, after all, so of course we all love each other. Um, so that's the in-group is the dominant group. People who are part of the dominant group are in. The out-group is the non-dominant group. And people who are in the non-dominant group may be out. Could it, yeah. Could it also be like um, even you know because sometimes in dominant groups um, there's like little circles of the non-dominant groups that are very tight. Yeah. And they'll consider the ones that are outside of that like the out group. The other. Oh, absolutely. Okay, it could be that way. Yeah. Like not necessarily like numbers, but more just uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Well, like it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So that you've got a group of uh, professionals. Um, and, yeah, the yeah. yeah, and and maybe the, in the that professional circle, this group is dominant, right. and they would look upon other people in the professional circle as not part of them yet, like a guild almost. Yeah. Um, or you've got a group of uh, white Caucasians who are exclusive of another group of white Caucasians. Consider college campuses where you've got fraternities that uh, discriminate against people who are not in sports or people who are. Um, uh, are in any way different from them. So yeah, sure. Um, in any homogenous group, 
you have clicks. Um, a group of Vietnamese may seem completely homogenous, but there's a difference between the Vietnamese from the south and the Vietnamese from the north. A question would be, how do those differences interact? In the United States, there's a difference between people from the American South and people from the North or the Midwest. Do they interact well? I'm from the South. Uh, there are jokes that I've heard growing up where Southerners are considered to be inferior to Northerners. Except in Texas. Except in Texas. Well, in Texas, I guess. Texas is not it's the South, but it's its own special. <laughs> Texas is its own special place because we were our own country. For nine years, we flew the Texas flag alone. We voluntarily entered the United States Union with the caveat that if we ever wanted to leave, we could. We tested that 15 years later in 1860 during uh, what is called the uh, recent unpleasantness. And that did not work, the Civil War. So Texas could not secede. Which, and there are people in Texas now who want to secede. Uh, they're out in, uh, they <laughs> are out in West Texas. The northern jokes about southerners down south end up translating into jokes about, about people from Alabama. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have somebody from Alabama or West Virginia. at this school, yeah. and I think he's a great guy. So everybody in Alabama, if they're like him, must also be great guys. Right. And women as well. Right. Um, okay, so we do have these cultural tensions. We do have in-groups and out-groups. How can we effectively work with one another? Um, if we consider another group as other, would be a question. When you go back to Vietnam and you see a Laotian, in what way uh, can you uh, encounter that Laotian as a human uh, with the fullness of human dignity? So um, we get into, um, in terms of negative responses, we get into bias. So there may be a bias for a particular kind of person or a particular kind of uh, uh, nationality or particular gender. So for instance, it was long said that in some professions only men could enter the professions. So um, I, I was speaking today with a young woman who was here. She said she opened up her philosophy book, her history to philosophy, and she said uh, it seemed like there were no women in the philosophy book when she opened it up. You know, uh, where were the women voices? And of course, Socrates, uh, Plato, Aristotle, St. Thomas, St. Augustine, Boethius, Bonaventure. Bonaventure. Thank you. These are all men. So is, it, uh, is there a bias against women? Philosophers. I remember reading in um, uh, some 18th century literature, Alexander Pope, for instance, that um, uh, women philosophers could not exist. Uh, there are two hard things to hit. True um, uh, no meaning baffles as much as wit. He said women and fools are two hard things to hit. True no meaning baffles as much as wit. It was thought that women did not have the intellectual capacity to engage in philosophy. We've disproved that here at Holy Apostles with all of our wonderful women philosophers. So there's a bias, stereotypes. The other uh, is always in a certain way. The other's not clean. The other is, um, so the other's dirty. The other's not smart. So the other lacks intelligence. Uh, the other is um, uh, socially inept. So for instance, if I like my space, and the other has a different concept of space, the other's going to come right up to me, and I'm going to go back. And the other's going to say, oh, let's take another step to me, and I'm going to go back. <laughs> as long as I'm not standing near a cliff, I'm safe until I step into traffic and get hit. In Tunisia, 
the men hold hands as they walk. So I'm walking down the street with a friend, a new friend. He takes my hand. And I'm thinking, ah, I'm holding hands with a man <laughs> walking down the street. Is this normal? Maybe. What, how do I feel about this? So, you know, you want to, like, let go of the guy's hand, but he's got it pretty strong. But that's, uh, it's a cultural thing. So there was nothing meant by it. In this country, we would see women holding hands all the time, and we would never think anything about two women walking down the street holding hands. At least growing up in East Texas, we didn't think anything like that. It could have a completely different connotation in other parts of this country. Yeah. So. Yeah. Discrimination. So these are the jokes. White privilege. What is white privilege? And it would be the same thing as Vietnamese privilege in Vietnam. Or uh, Tunisian privilege in Tunisia, you know, uh, or Swedish privilege in Sweden, maybe. Uh, but what's white privilege? When we talk about, uh, we would put it in terms of race. <coughs> Any buttons? Tyler? Um, it's. it's would it be? Would it? Would it just be somebody who uh, uh, wouldn't quite privilege be um, someone who can get through the system without uh, w without any uh, stifles? Good. That's that's what we would consider white privilege to be. So white privilege is that entire social structure, that entire societal makeup that is uh, geared toward the dominant culture. And the dominant culture on planet Earth may be considered to be white, which is interesting because on planet Earth, uh, whites are not the majority. You take the entire planet, uh, the inhabitants on this planet who are white are probably not over three and a half billion strong. So if that's being the case, white privilege comes from a number, a number of other things. So for instance, colonization, uh, for instance, economic capital, education, literary production, uh, theological acumen, perhaps. Are there other uh, sources of white privilege? So when I grew up, in my society in Tyler, Texas, I moved through the structures that existed. I did have a problem in that I was Catholic in a largely Baptist area. So there was a religious difference where I was not a member of the dominant class. But uh, we had many Hispanics who lived in East Texas, and we had many African Americans who lived in East Texas. The whites, the Caucasians who lived in East Texas, had a certain kind of uh, ability to move through the system with fewer difficulties than those who were non-white, who were black or Hispanic. So in the Hispanic case, perhaps it was language, perhaps it was other things. Um, in the African-American case, in the black case, uh, there was a, a racial history. So growing up, we always had, my family had housekeepers. The housekeepers were always African American. Growing up, my dad hired people to clean the yard. Rake the leaves, uh, mow the yard. They were predominantly Hispanic. And the one uh, member of the uh, Mexican team who spoke English instantly became the foreman and he would be paid a little bit extra because he could tell everybody else what to do. Yeah. But, um, just like to put another angle on that. In that, point, in that example, I can sort of see why that would be the case, that someone that spoke English got paid extra. Because not so much because he spoke the language in English, but because he communicated with your dad. Sure. So he could do something like that. He had a skill that said, you know, Right, he was paid for his skill. So I, I, he had, yeah. To me, that seems fair enough that someone could speak, be able to have that extra talent, 
that he's developed and worked on to be remunerated more for an English absolutely a success in our society. Right. But so it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be English. Like as in, you know, if you was in, if say if someone was in um, Germany, left Germany, and they spoke. You know, all the workers spoke Arabic, and the one guy that spoke German, of course, would be the one in charge because he can communicate with the client. Right, right, right. You know. And 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 that's a good thing. That's um, yeah, that sort of makes sense. Like some, I don't see that as a prejudice yeah. or anything like that. Right, right. Yeah. No, no, that's not a prejudice at all because that's a member of the same group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in fact, a, denying that person a job that um, uh, for which that person was fully qualified. Uh, in preference for a white person who was also fully qualified, uh, maybe there's something to talk about there. Uh, and so he works uh, on these work teams um, because he does have a skill that he can exploit, and that is his ability to translate and his ability to work on a team where he can uh, serve as a foreman or something. So that's a, I would say that uh, any uh, uh, skills that you develop um, that are useful to you in a society or things that you should be using. Uh, but uh, what if uh, his uh, children uh, cannot get into school because he is an undocumented immigrant? So um, let's say his children are, uh, are then allowed in school and 30 years later, um, or every presidential administration revisits whether or not undocumented immigrants are going to be allowed to stay and put their children in public schools. Um, so there would be uh, some disadvantages, uh, some things that he would be working against as he tries to move as a member of the minority through a dominant culture. And um, we might experience that as well if we move to a different country. But take, for instance, a Vietnamese who moves to Laos, gets the better job because the Vietnamese is considered uh, by the uh, persons who are hiring people uh, within the industries in Laos the Vietnamese is considered to be a more valuable employee over uh, perhaps an equally qualified Laotian. Uh, so, I mean, in what sense then um, is, can we see this, um, these marks of a dominant culture uh, even outside of their own cultural groups um, uh, being able to exercise privilege? And you can even see that how that transcends like in the Hispanic community and when I worked in the past and what I noticed was this huge category of Hispanic, but the majority of Hispanics that I saw move up in the ranks and in the higher positions of authority predominantly were Caucasian. Caucasian or, Hispanics. Yeah, mostly Caucasian. So you didn't really see like a lot of Native American, Hispanic, or a mixture thereof moving as far up. So I don't know if that's subconscious or it's just, you know, the cultural continuity between the predominantly white population and the white Hispanics, or I, I have no idea. But I, it's just bringing that up as a nuance. I don't know how much truth there is to that either, but that's you know, it's anecdotal on my part. I heard, um, speaking of anecdotal, I heard uh, somebody uh, when I was growing up in East Texas refer to another, um, to a black family who lived in our area as, um, you, do you remember the Cosby show uh, where uh, you had a, a, a gynecologist, Bill Cosby was a gynecologist and his wife was a lawyer? What was the name of that show? Was that, uh, was that the Cosby show? And what was the name of the family in the Cosby show? The Huxtables. Right. So the Huxtables. So the Huxtables were a black family that were very successful. They were a black family where the father was a gynecologist and the mother was a lawyer. They were a black family that had children that got along with one another, that went through various conflicts, but that integrated very well with the society in which they lived. So the person with whom I was speaking um, pointed out uh, a black family in our neighborhood and said, they're just like the Huxtables. You'll love them. Meaning they were fully integrated into white society. Right. You know, that they were, they were professionals. Their children were in private schools. Uh, they did not speak Ebonics. 
you know, Bill Cosby did not speak Ebonics, and his children did not speak Ebonics. Ebonics is a, a, a form of black English. Ebonics is black English. Uh, and uh, uh, many people have written on Ebonics. Um, there's one book that I read by J.L. Dillard called Black English. It talks about the way in which Ebonics was formed. It's a Portuguese grammatical structure on top of which was placed an American vocabulary within which was placed uh, a, a method of communicating with one another that the dominant society would not understand. So that um, if you had a number of persons come together speaking English, uh, black persons from different countries or different regions of West Africa, speaking English with one another because that's the only language that was common to all of them, that they could speak English and use words that were different, that the meaning was different, from what uh, their white masters could understand, and therefore they could speak in code. So, um, so uh, the Huxtables did not speak Ebonics. So to call somebody a Huxtable family was to say they're just like us, they're the good kind. In a world where you do have examples of uh, African Americans who are poor, on welfare, single parents, uh, we would say as Catholics at least they gave birth to their children, um, those who are single parents. Um, we have a stereotype that uh, blacks are on drugs and that they steal and, uh, and all the things that white America would not want to embrace. And so we develop uh, a racist attitude, perhaps, where we say our race, because we do, are not these things, uh, makes us different from and better than this other group that is, um, that is all these things that are negative. Yeah. The one thing that I think is interesting about white privilege is that um, <laughs> Sorry, we need to get you on that. Yeah, right. Um, the thing about white privilege, if you're talking about three and a half billion people, in fact, it's probably a much lesser amount, a much less fewer, just because right. there's so much diversity within the white population. Right. So social class really divides us, as does religion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are white Muslims, white Arabs, white Jews, and, you know, I am a white Jew converted. So, I mean, I know that there are areas where I still would not be welcome if they knew what I am apart from being a Catholic theologian. And right. certainly with social class, I mean, it's not unusual for the upper white classes to refer to white trash, which is what would be most considered most lower class white people. Right. So, so the white privilege thing is really an upper class professional male Protestant phenomenon. That's what I would argue. So you're probably speaking, I don't know, a couple of million people. It's a minority, it yes. is the point. It is a serious minority. It's not It's not as many as three and a half billion. No, no, I, I, I was saying, that, yeah, right. Within that group, right, right. within that three and a half billion, many people that are white are oppressed. Right. No, I was saying I don't think there's th uh, three and a half billion white oh, people. Okay, I thought you said something like that. No, 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 uh, because um, in order for the white um, culture to be dominant, Globally, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. we'd have to be at least half the people. Yeah. You know, in terms oh, of being so, a majority. Oh, because when you said three and a half, that's what I thought. Yeah, I said we're not we're, we're not even close to three yeah. and a half. Regardless of what number of white people there are, you know, this to me, white white privilege is a fiction. Okay. It is largely a male Protestant upper class or professional class phenomenon, and I suspect it's a fiction that was created by those particular males. Um, well, what those particular males would have done was they would have created an infrastructure or system that works for them. Yes, yes. And if, the world. Right. And if they do dominate the world, economically, socially, uh, yeah. culturally, yeah. Uh, consider all the films we export around the world uh, mm -hmm. that uh, create problems uh, for us in other uh, cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, are cleansed in other cultures if they're watched over there mm -hmm. to get rid of the cultural impurities uh, from a white secular society. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The movie Speed, for instance, I saw on a train um, in Egypt, mm -hmm. 
And uh, there's a scene in Speed where Keanu Reeves saves a woman from an elevator. Well, in the American version of the film, the woman's skirt flies up over her back. And so you can see her underwear mm -hmm. as he pulls the woman out of the uh, elevator. In the Egyptian version, it's a long skirt she's wearing, and it does not fly up. So she maintains her full modesty. So uh, American films tend to play with modesty in ways that other countries do sure. not. Um, okay, so, um, but thank you for that, because that's important. Uh, to question whether or not white privilege is re real uh, is, uh, is an authentic way of describing. So um, if you are marked, you're different from then if you're unmarked. To be in a dominant culture, to enjoy something like white privilege, you have to be unmarked in pretty much everything. When I say marked and unmarked, I mean this. White people are unmarked. People of color are marked by their color. Poor people are marked by their poverty. Whereas the middle class or upper middle class is pretty much unmarked. So for instance, I could be upper class or middle class. You don't know because I'm wearing the kind of suit perhaps that a middle class or an upper class person would wear. I, uh, I put on some clothes that are grunge clothes and maybe you don't know. Except you might see that my fingernails are not dirty. So I'm not doing manual labor. I may go outside and try to do some manual labor just so that I can look like a workman, but I may not talk like it. You know? The moment I speak, if you've seen My Fair Lady, I encourage everybody to watch My Fair Lady. Because it starts out with Professor Henry Eggins, who is able to um, discern in London the street that somebody lives on based on their accent. And he takes a poor woman with um, a very uh, uh, rustic, very cockney, a cockney accent, and tries to convert her into a lady simply by changing the way she speaks. So at one point, he has the lady speaking perfectly. She's using round tones, and when she speaks, she sounds like a member of the upper class. Yet the content of what she's speaking is the same content that you would find in the place from which she came. So she starts talking in very round, upper-class tones about her uncle who did somebody in. <laughs> so at which point, suddenly the content is what marks her. So the thing is, once you're marked, you're marked in a way that excludes you from the dominant group. If you see a Laotian in Vietnam, what makes you know the person is Laotian? What marker does he have on it? They're taller and darker. So it's a color marker. So if you see somebody who's darker than you are, you may think Laotian. Whereas if a person in America, a white person, sees you, they may think Chinese. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and they look um, uh, wild. They look wild? Okay, like they've just come out of the woods. Oh, they look where their clothing is different. So you see, there's four markers right there. So for them to blend in the Vietnamese society, they have to lose all four of those markers. For um, uh, an African American or Hispanic to blend into a white society, they have to lose many markers, but there's certain markers they can't lose. They can't lose color unless um, uh, they try to, and I've seen some people use creams to make themselves lighter. Uh, they can't lose the hair because it's kinky. So there are hair straighteners that some will use in order to, uh, to look uh, as good as the dominant class. They want straight hair. So there was a doll test that was done. And uh, there, uh, there's controversy about this doll test. But you take a white baby doll, 
and a black baby doll that look exactly the same. They're dressed exactly the same. The only difference is the color. And members of the uh, black community, children, viewed the black doll as less attractive than the white doll. Why? Because perhaps they identified with the dominant culture. What's that? It's a social construct. They've been taught, taught and think that way at a very early age. The interesting thing about Marcus that we were just talking about, if I can go back for a second, is during sure. the Holocaust, we still Jews from other white people, by and large. Um, and so in some places, Jews were made to wear yellow stars of David to, send, to set you off so that people would know you were Jewish and it would be against the law to take those off if you were outside. So that's a marker that is enforced by... Uh, it's an artificial marker. It's an artificial oh, marker that is enforced by uh, an unjust legal system. I'm sure that it's not something that has happened to just Jews. The Nazis weren't that smart. So there's probably uh, other examples of that, but that's the only one I'm aware of. I read um, that when the uh, Ashkenazim Jews mm -hmm. came from Germany into Israel, mm -hmm. For them to be able to tell the difference between the uh, uh, Jews who were Israeli yeah. uh, and the Muslims who looked just like the Jews, they made the Muslims wear uh, crescents. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because there you have, uh, you know, among Jews themselves, there was an interesting article uh, written by Sam Nagler years ago, and he suggested that. Um, one of the reasons that uh, America, did, the United States, did not do more to save Jews during the Holocaust is because they didn't want to save them, they didn't like them. Even the Jews in this country were hesitant to have Jewish immigrants come here because it would hurt their social class, their status. So, you know, it really is something that you have to look at, not just between groups, but within groups who are trying to protect themselves from what would be considered a superior uh, mm -hmm. social structure. That could have been a class issue or an elitist issue, too, by the yeah. Jewish American community yeah. at the time. Because we were talking about a lot of Eastern Europeans mm -hmm. that yes, were exactly. not as educated, yeah. Yeah. okay, and they were more into the trade. And very, very different culturally Jewish, but very different culturally. Right. So they would actually, so I mean, consider that we're talking about Jews here who are actually willing to let other Jews die, even though they themselves, if they were in Germany, would have been killed or in Poland. Well, yeah, and so Hannah Arendt really, speaks about yeah. that whole issue as well, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll yeah. just go on with uh, the social constructs. I just remember, I can't remember the exact uh, title of it, but I think it was just taken to the classes of psychology, how they put group, random groups of people uh, just uh, actually just branded individuals into separate groups and they would do some testing and then they eventually had them know there's another group there and they're ready whenever they didn't meet them or anything or if they just meet them briefly and all these testing they noticed when they wrote about what they thought of the other group as soon as they said the other that they already put themselves above them so it seems to be maybe it's even just innate to be kind of a protective thing but they had that and uh, I don't think you can get and just, right, they're talking about social class, but I, I was thinking that I remember uh, just doing this retreat and this um, priest would ask us a few questions and I kept on saying, when you're sitting there in your community praying, she looked around saying, oh, I'm, and you know, it happens because we're broken. Oh, I, I mean, if everyone prayed like me, I have a better gesture, I do better. That brother, you know, he's, right. he's over pious. I, you know, I'm the more, and you know, it's amazing to see how even that, not just on race, just how we can just be in a religious community having a biases, thinking we're just, right, it might be in, you know, any community or like the school system here, like just thinking, well, I, you know, I just went to Harvard, this person didn't go to this school, and they have, you know, positions or even biases where someone else gets a higher wage, but maybe someone else deserved it, and just because of status and friend, uh, friendship, so there's, a lot of things that can play into that, and I just remember, uh, I think with, yeah, just in the Catholic Church itself too, 
and maybe it's getting better, but just the fact, you know, when they say conservative, liberal, or this that this church, they do the, you know, extraordinary form, or this one, oh, well, and they have the bias already thinking, the priest that doesn't know Latin, or that have Latin, oh, he must be liberal, or he must, you know, he's probably not too orthodox. Really? The ones that are, no right? vote, or do we? And then, where, you know, the person who's very orthodox could be really, like, not following the teachings that well either. So it's like, it's amazing how so those little thing nuances can make us biased. So I'm wondering how individually, how do we work on just accepting the fact that we're probably always going to have a, you know, not to be, like, learn not to be rash, but to have that, knowing that we automatically might assess someone less than us because it's like a protective thing. Right. And that when we're doing, because I've noticed at least it seems like we're getting better at, at least on a superficial level with trying to accept others and be more open to diversity because we're growing up with it a lot more. But wonder, I guess the, when it gets down deeper, how far do we really, how much do we know how biased we are? I guess it's... Well, you, you've already made the first step and that's awareness. The fact that you can even make that statement means that you're aware that this is possible for all of us. That you're aware that all those markings now, when you're praying and somebody does something differently, they're marking themselves as different from you. Or you are subconsciously marking them as different. You know, this person, uh, normally when we pray, uh, when we go up for communion, we should take communion by the tongue. This person takes it in the hand. What, he doesn't love Jesus? <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, he's just going to throw Jesus all over the floor when he does this and walk on him? You know, I mean, the, the, I mean, there are people who will make that claim, and they'll set apart those who respect Jesus in their minds from everybody else. But we're all going up for communion, which means we all, you know. I'm going to finish up, and then we'll get some ice cream. Um, which is breakfruit. For the audience out there, you've got your own ice cream. <laughs> you can, during the break, go and get it and join us in solidarity. Um, so um, there's a don't talk rule and a talk rule, and this is what we've been doing. Uh, the don't talk rule says we must not talk about race, we ought to deny any feelings that we have regarding race, and we should not trust ourselves with the subject. Because there's a fear out there that the moment that we say race at all, we're suddenly mark ourselves as racist. You know, it's like um, I provided, I taught uh, English composition for 20 years. And I provided to my students once an article by Gloria Naylor called The Meanings of a Word. In The Meanings of the Word, she talks about the word nigger. It's the N-word. It's the word that nobody's supposed to say. But Gloria Naylor, who's an African-American, says this word actually has six different meanings in African-American culture. And she goes through those meanings. And she says, but when I heard it from a white boy, it only had one meaning. Right. And my mother, because she knew I had to grow up in white America, sat me down on her knee and told me what that meaning was. So I give this, I gave this uh, reading to my students every year for years. And there was always one or two or three African Americans in the class out in St. Charles, Missouri. And those African Americans who were in the class when they encountered that text, would speak about it in a way that made the white people uh, more comfortable also speaking about it. So I would leave the class and they would say, great class, prof. We learned a lot about each other, prof. Right. And so on. <laughs> Whatever, how much you can do in 50 minutes, right? So one day I gave the article to a class that had only white people in it. None of the white people knew how to respond to what I was saying as I went through the meanings of the word and what Gloria Naylor was arguing and or, uh, explaining and the observation that she had made. And about halfway through the class, one of them says, uh, uh, Mahfoud, uh, are you a racist? Why are you giving us an article with the word nigger in it? You're doing this only because there's no black people here, right? If there were black people here, you wouldn't give us this article. And I said, well, on the contrary, it actually works if there's black people in the room. <laughs> because they can talk about it in context. So you just well, said they. And that's contextual, too. 
right. in the words being used. The person could be referring to their friend, or they could be referring to somebody else, uh, and it's actually being used as a downgrade on that other person within the black community. Or it could be used as an upgrade or on another upgrade. person. Yeah, but ten, depending on the context. Right. One thing I remember uh, just on thing my uncle was arguing with my dad about we're getting so caught up in race, the racism, and anytime someone, like you're saying, talking about race or different differences, you know, that could lead to big bigotry. And, he, and his big argument with my dad being a separate person didn't want to su succeed. But yeah, so when a police officer comes and there's a bunch of different races and they want to get a profile, if someone is good enough to remember how to describe them and say, is it going to be racist at the police officer, did they have Jewish features, did they have Italian features, did they have certain features that might be prevalent to a culture. And my dad said, well, of course, that's racist. Because yeah. you can't, but then say, how are you going to describe me? Like, how do you tell someone what they look like? And I mean, the police per person needed to draw it, probably needs to ask certain features. So it was interesting to see that it could get so legalistic that right. you would say, well, this is a well, stick person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, right. So that would be indistinguishable, yeah. which of course doesn't help uh, the actual cause of the reason why that's being done. Uh, in um, St. Louis, I've heard that some people, and in the American South, I've heard some people uh, consider themselves um, having been pulled over for DWB. Do you know Driving what DWB? Driving while black. Driving while black. Right. You know, and if somebody's got a nice car and that person's black and gets pulled over, they're asked for the registration to prove that they own the car. Because they're black, so yeah. um, I mean, presumably, right? And this is the claim. And then even black people in the United States refer to their skin color in a gradation, or it used to be anyways in the South. Well, that's where you get the idea of the color bar. Right. So in the South, uh, there was, yellow is right, know, right. Like, yeah, the darker you are, the lower you are. So the lower you are. Right. Um, it was often the case that women. Black women would want to marry a man, or black men would want to marry a woman that was one shade lighter, mm -hmm. all the way up. In fact, you see this in some literature. Um, I think a Malcolm Little's mother intentionally married a man who was much blacker than she was, because right. she wanted to bring back the black, you know, and, and, and embrace her roots. And right. I think uh, Malcolm Little, Malcolm X, talks about that in his book. Yeah, and I talk about the relationship between white males and, and black females, you know, in the South. Right. Actually, back all the way back to the 50s because they were looking to have their children taken care of and, you know, the possibility of them going to college, et cetera, which did happen, you know. The interesting thing about the South and the different colors is those colors were a result of white masters in some cases. Mm -hmm. Usually, you say? White masters having um, sexual relations with black slave women. Mm -hmm. So what did they do to their children? They sold them, yeah. their own children, as slaves. Yeah. Usually away from the plantation so that the white wife would not uh, worry so much. Right. But their own children, the children of white men, were sold by those white men into slavery. Actually, there's a lot of... Uh, Going back years ago when I was studying to be a sociologist, there were studies being done uh, using historical demography that more or less showed that uh, there was, it was the equivalent of breeding dogs. So they, the white men would actually sleep with a lot of the slaves mm -hmm. and have as many children as possible and then sell them. So it was like breeding a dog. And <laughs> they could actually get a higher price yeah, as yeah. well for the mm -hmm. slaves. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. those slaves were then used yeah. in, as house servants, this, that, and the other yeah. thing. Yeah. And then obviously the... They were de-Africanized yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, well, also other white male masters found the, uh, the mulatto uh, well, women more, more attractive, attractive. Yeah. so... Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, we've been... Um, finding creative ways to exploit one another for a very long time. Yeah. Right. So the do talk rule then is we must talk about race, so it's the opposite of the don't talk rule. The don't talk rule 
do talk about, we ought to express our feelings about race, and we should trust our own efforts to express the reality of racism to guide our journey. So that's, that's what this uh, unit's about, is simply to confront the reality that we do look upon an other in a prejudicial, biased, uh, perhaps racist manner. All right, we will start with the next section right after the break. So um, I'm going to go uh, bring a cake and some plates if somebody would like to help me. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll be back. So those of you in our viewing audience, you actually won't experience the break if you're watching this delayed. You know. Right, what's that? You could watch us eat ice cream. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Erica, you can choose what you want to do with the belt at this point. Okay.